And who is Brian Bain? A graduate student at Harvard Law School. I've gone to Harvard for two years now, but I've been black all my life. Bain's parents were immigrants from Trinidad. His father, Raleigh Bain, had been a photographer in the U.S. Army, and so they moved around a lot. And now his dad is a teacher in upstate New York. Brian's mother, Veronica, is a nurse. And to make sure her three sons, her husband, and a nephew could go to college, she held three jobs, and she still does. My mom would always say, you have to work three times as hard, you know, once because you're black, two, twice because you're, you're I'm Trinidad, you know, you're West Indian, and three times because after I sacrifice so much, you better not let me down, you know? So she always, you know, instilled in us this idea that, you know, we could achieve whatever we wanted to achieve, and there, the sky was the limit. As a teenager in upstate New York, Brian and his brother Christopher, known as Kay, and their cousin Kyle Vasquez, for obvious reasons called Red, were bused to a school that was 90% white. Every week there was a different racial incident that happened. Seeing like nigger on your locker in like ninth grade, I remember. K. Bain is a Niger, they spelt it wrong. Niger? Yeah. But Breon Bain shielded himself from the racism they encountered. He was gonna be Mr. Academics. He was gonna use this environment, which was very unfriendly for us, and get into his studies and be in the honor society. And I be remember in seventh grade, him running up and down the halls with posters, Breon Bain for, for president, <laughs> Breon Bain. Seventh grade, yeah. Seventh grade. So, and that's how he chose to deal with it. And he kept on campaigning while he went to Columbia University in New York, where he was voted class president each of his four years there. And then he got his master's degree at NYU, and today he is only months away from getting his law degree from Harvard. K. Bain, his brother, graduated from Brooklyn College and worked for the New Jersey Department of Corrections. And Red Vasquez, a clerical assistant at a New York City hospital, attended community college. So why would the police zero in on Bain, his brother, and his cousin, arrest them on a charge of criminal mischief, put them in a jail cell, and hold them overnight? Well, in October of 1999, the three had spent an evening at the Latin Quarter, a nightclub over there on Manhattan's Upper West Side. What were you wearing? Some some is what we have on now. It's three o'clock in the morning. You're in the uniform, which speaks to some people. Hey, come on, three black thugs walking around. That's the stereotype. If we dressed the way you were dressed, suits and ties yeah. would develop a stigma. Not to mention that where I live, in Brooklyn, New York, where I'm from, this is a Brooks Brothers suit. This might as well be my Brooks Brothers suit because I, I fit perfectly into that environment they're dressed like this. You, on the other hand, in full green, are very out of place. They say their arrest happened this way. Before heading home from the club, they went to get a sandwich at this deli a block away from the nightclub. Have a fair amount to drink? We don't drink. We don't drink. None of us. We don't drink at all. Really? Yeah. At the deli, they saw a couple of men shouting and throwing bottles up at a second floor window. And then they say those men jumped in a car and drove away. And wanting to avoid any hassle, Bain, his brother, and his cousin left, they said, and walked back up toward the club and their subway train home. Along the way, they ran into the Latin Quarter's bouncers who told the police that the three of them had been the troublemakers. Give them a break. What might have led them to believe that you were the guy? No breaks, no breaks. Their assumption was these black kids are responsible for the problem. By the time they reached the subway station, three white police officers had arrived. They got you up against the wall right. like this. Right. Is that correct? Right. Did they frisk you? Yeah, they frisk us down. Where? Like, all, all down, all, that, to our legs, to our ankles, all the way up and down, in our crotches, you know? Yeah. And then Red keeps trying to turn around to explain, look, we didn't do anything. Ask the people upstairs. Look, we didn't do anything. There's witnesses. Ask the people. And every time Red turned around, he would, like, throw Red back against the wall and push him as hard as he could. To, and he was telling him, shut up, shut up, shut up. And then all three were handcuffed and led back up to the street. During the arrest, Sergeant Ronald Connolly found Bain's laptop computer. The cop was like, where'd you steal this from? You know, and I was like, I'm a law student, again. You know, he's like, where do you go to law school? I said, I go to Harvard. He's like, oh, that's an expensive school. My kids can't afford to go there. How do you afford to go, afford to go there? This is the cop. This is the cop, Officer Connolly. So I said, well, I have, I have a partial scholarship. He said, oh, you, got a, you must have a ball scholarship to be going to school like that. Basketball or something. Right, right. So I just looked at him and said, I have a scholarship, but not football. And it wasn't the first time this kind of thing had happened to Breon Bain. 
getting treated like a second-class citizen wasn't a new thing. You know, I, when I got accepted to Georgetown Law School and was checking out law schools down there, um, I got off the bus in D.C., and two cops stopped me as soon as I got off the bus and, you know, asked me if they could go through my stuff. And I said, sure, I have nothing to hide. They went through my bag, went through my pocket, they frisked me down. And it, again, it was a humiliating experience. So it was just because you were black? Right, right. They said specifically to me that they were having a problem with people bringing in drugs from New York to D.C. And so they wanted to go through my stuff. And Bain says that this kind of racial profiling by police has happened to him many times, being singled out because of the color of his skin. And to the cops in New York City that night, he says he wasn't a black man, he was a boy. He says that's how Officer Connolly repeatedly referred to him, his brother, and his cousin. What does boys mean to you? Sergeant Connolly categorically denies he spoke to them in that manner. Deputy Commissioner George Grasso is the New York City Police Department's attorney. He emphatically denied that Sergeant Connolly used any inappropriate language that evening, and he advised Sergeant Connolly not to speak with us. Grasso says the sergeant had simply been responding to an emergency phone call from the apartment above the deli. Two elderly people, a brother and a sister, mm -hmm. they thought shots were being fired at their apartment, and they called 911, and they called in shots fired. Grasso says that Sergeant Connolly then spoke with the Latin Quarter's bouncers, who patrol the neighborhood, he says, at the request of the NYPD. The security officer said that he personally saw each of these individuals throwing bottles at that building. But when we spoke with the bouncers off camera, they told us they did not see who actually threw the bottles. But they said they were sure the police got the right guys. Grasso says Sergeant Connolly was just doing his job and when we asked him whether or not this was a case of racial profiling... To allege or imply that our officers and our department routinely violate the constitutional rights of people of color in this city is untrue, scurrilous, and wrong. That's what the NYPD and New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani said in response to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights and the U.S. Justice Department last year after both groups had charged the New York City Police Department with racial profiling. Blacks and Latinos are overwhelmingly the victims of racial profiling, yes. And Terrence Wansley yeah, is in a position to know. He's an NYPD detective and co-founder of an organization called 100 Blacks in Law Enforcement, a group that's been openly critical of NYPD racial profiling. And apparently the United States government is saying to New York's police department, Get your act together, correct? That's correct. It's a long time overdue. Were you surprised to see this? Absolutely not. Should black kids, should Latino kids act differently when they come across the cop? Without question. 100 Blacks in Law Enforcement, we have a program called What to Do When Stopped by the Police. Yeah. And the focus of this is to survive the encounter. We don't advocate people practicing justice on the corner. We say, survive the encounter, get your justice later on. The day after his arrest, Breon Bain returned to law school and wrote an essay about what had happened to him. It was published last May in New York's Village Voice newspaper. When did you tell your mother about what happened? We didn't. She got the first copy of the Village Voice when it came out. What'd she say when she, when she saw that? Well, she called me up and she said, well, you know, we have to fight this thing. We have to fight this thing because you can't just let this sit. You can't just let this happen to you and not respond to it. Bain told his mother his essay was his response, and the reaction to it was immediate from all around the country because it was also published on the Internet, more than 50,000 hits on the newspaper's website. His article was titled, Walking While Black, The Bill of Rights for Black Men. What Bain did was to rewrite the Ten Amendments of the U.S. Constitution's Bill of Rights from a black man's perspective, weaving in the story of his arrest. Amendment 1. Congress can make no law altering the established fact that a black man is a nigger. Amendment number two, the right of any white person to apprehend a nigger will not be infringed. Bain says he used the word nigger in his essay specifically to make a point. I would say people should be offended by the term. I was offended by the way that I was treated. And much more than profane language, I'm concerned about the profane conditions in which people live and die. Amendment seven. Niggers must remain within the confines of their own neighborhoods. Those who do not are clearly looking for trouble. As an example, look, three guys dressed like you coming along Madison Avenue.
you know, white, white territory. And a little noise, and maybe a boom box. And people are saying, for crying out loud, why don't they write? Does that make me a racist? I've been annoyed by loud music myself, and I don't think that would make me a racist, so I don't see why it makes you one. I don't think the issue is loud music. You still see people cross the street, grab their pocketbooks. So take away the music, take away the style of dress if you want, but you still have the same reaction. Hurts you? I think it's a reminder. It lets you know where you are and let you know that things have really haven't changed all that much. After turning up with a lawyer for four court-ordered appearances over a five-month period, the case against them was dismissed and the court records were sealed. No evidence and no witnesses against them were ever presented in court. Amendment 10, a nigger who has no arrest record just hasn't been caught yet. You got no arrest record, except for this last... Yeah, and if anything should ever happen again, they'll call, look up my record, and they'll say, oh, this guy has a record, so obviously... Yeah, they guilty. dropped the, the case again. They dropped the case. I still have an arrest record, though. You know, it's still there. And it you is. want that arrest record expunged? I would love to have it expunged. I expunged so it doesn't ruin his future. You going to run for office? I doubt it. I'm Come just, on, you love to talk. I want to be an organizer, an activist, an educator, an yeah. artist. Politics, politics turns me off because everybody's afraid to tell the truth. And people are afraid to call it like they see it. And well, that's just what Bain says he intends to keep on doing. For one thing, he's out talking to other students here at Hunter College in New York. I don't see myself as a victim as much as I see myself as a person with a cause, you know, and with an agenda and a plan to challenge the status quo. This is a stupid question, but answer it. Take it seriously. Would you rather be white? A great line from a, a poem that I, I recently heard says, I wish that I were white. I wish that I were white so that I could know what it was like to want to be black.